Then you had the issue. At that time, 1995, Abu Usama and his first tour. Because you know when people go to make war, they go on tours, you know, your first war tour, your second tour. Your second. Well, this was Abu Usama's first tour. Now, many of you don't know Abu Usama was here in 1995 to 1997. Put up your hands if you knew. Four out of the 400. Many of you don't know this. But Abu Usama had just graduated from Medina and came over to England and I quote to help the black community. <laughs> Yarhamukallah. I quote to help the black community. As soon as Abu Sama came here, he expressed his dislike for those Pakistanis at Green Lane and their dawah and their call. That's the first thing he expressed. He also expressed, I ain't doing nothing in their masjid. They ain't here to help us. They're just here to use us. Some old slavery talk. Huh? So, when he came here, he probably felt that the brothers from Birmingham were able to help his cause. He wanted to settle here in England and call the people to la ilaha illallah, or should I say, to help out the black brothers. We in England could not afford to take care of him. In Birmingham, sorry. We couldn't afford it. We had no masjid. There was a maybe 30 of us, 40 of us, black brothers. But we couldn't afford to take care of Abu Salam and pay his needs and his wants. So what did he do? He went to Brixton. So now we're going to talk about this era of time. This time here, Abu Salam going to Brixton. 1996, 97. Abu Sama was in Brixton. They couldn't afford to take care of him. Because Brixton, they were surviving in the masjid by the skin of their teeth. To be quite honest, before I enter into that, when Brixton inherited their masjid down there, and I remember the day it was called a revolution. When the Sufis who used to own the masjid were forced out. At that time you had Faisal who used to give dawah down there. You know Faisal Jamaiki, Ta'abani, Tikfiri. Huh? He used to give dawah down there. Along with Abdul Malik who was worse than Faisal. But many of you don't know Abdul Malik Trinidadi. You don't know him. But he was worse than Faisal. The revolution took place in the masjid. Where they were going to put somebody new in charge. Salafi. Somebody who had to rule it with Kua. Why? Because Brixton is not no easy place to go in like that. And alhamdulillah, they chose Abu Sufyan. Because in that time... Dawah in London was headed by the likes of Abu Sufyan. <coughs> like it, who like it, hate it, who hate it. For those who know Abu Sufyan, he lasted six months. <laughs> the reason why he lasted six months wasn't because Abu Sufyan is a horrible person. But Abu Sufyan said, Faisal can't teach here no more. Faisal's wife can't teach Arabic. These guys from Muntaza can't come here and do the rules. These guys can't. And stopped all of Ahlul Bidah. Sururin and Qutubin doing any type of lessons, any type of dawah in Brixton. So after a while, the masjid became dead. 
Why? Because there was no tulab here. No, everyone was, no one was abroad studying like that. This is 95, 96. This was times when there was hardly no one there. No one to give dawah like that. And Dimas were refuted. And Abu Ali and those guys lived on the other side of London. And were prepared to come over and aid. So, the brothers lost heart. And then they removed Abu Sufyan after six months. And then they put in Allah Yahdihim Abdul Haq Baker. And then the masjid went downhill. But we will get on to that a bit later on. This is going to be a long lesson, inshallah, ikhwan wa khawat. It is important that many of you understand some of these masail and some of these issues that took place in the past. Anyway, Abu Usama goes to Brixton. And they can only afford to pay maybe £120 <coughs> per week to do a khutbah. And so, because they have no money. So he's in a dilemma now. Because he doesn't want to go back to America, he wants to stay in Great Britain. Brixton themselves, there were plans that they wanted to do. They wanted to open a bookshop in their shop, in their masjid in order to generate some falus, some money. So after a few months, another group who turned up in London, who set up a bookshop and started looking to infiltrate Great Britain, turned up. And that was Ihya al-Turaf. Now some of you need to know about Ihya turaf Who are Ihya turaf Ihya turaf they were a charitable organization. This was the origin of Ihya turaf They were a Kuwaiti organization set up to spread the khair a, a money. To the poor and the needy. Now you have to remember Kuwait. In the 50s, the 60s. Oil appeared in Kuwait. Kuwait is only that big on the map. You can go from one side of Kuwait to the other. In 20 minutes. Yet at that time they were supplying. A fifth of the world's oil. That's big money. The, the population of Kuwait was maybe 900,000 people, in which half of them became millionaires. <laughs> Instantly. So now these people needed to give sadaqah, because they got to pay zakat. So here comes Ihya Turaf. They set up this organization in order to gather the zakat of the Agniya, of the rich of Kuwait, and distribute it to the poor. Around the world. So what went wrong? What actually went wrong is that Ihya Taraf decided to open up an Islamic wing of their charitable organization. In which they put the likes of Abdurrahman Abdul Khalik, the Sururi, the Qutubi, Abdul Asabt, Sururi Qutubi in charge. Now their plan is just to spread their sururi kutubi dawah up and down the world. So what would Ihya Turaf do? Look at the evil of Ihya Turaf. They would go to a place like, for instance, Kenya. This is an example. I'm not saying they did it, but they did the same thing in many places. They would go to a place like Kenya. Where there were probably a few people who graduated from the Jamia who knew Arabic. But they were poor. Because Kenya generally is a poor country. And in Kenya, when people are poor, you can influence them to do quite a lot. If you got, like Sheikh Mokbul said, Kuwaiti Danan here. Hey, the Kuwaiti Dinar. Huh? So what they would do, they would... Go to a country like this. Go to some other tulab and say, look, we're going to build a masjid. 
in your community. We're going to build a markas in your community. Maybe two or three of them in Kenya, because it's so big. And what we want from you, we want you to be the imam. Now, this is an individual, Talib, maybe 25, 22, 23 years old. That's not even got a job. He's probably living on 30 pence or 20 pence a day. He has no money. Now this organization turns up. We're going to build a masjid out of marble. And then we're going to employ you and we're going to pay you 600 pounds a month. Because we have millions. And we're going to pay a few of you. Six, seven hundred pounds a month. Now try and think about it. You is miskin. 20, 30 pence a day. Now we're going to pay you 600 pounds a month. To give khutbah and to guide the people there. Then, in the summer. And periodically during the year. We're going to send our tulab, our kutubi, the sururi tulab, and their, their teachers or some of their sheikhs. And we want you to translate for them. Now let's imagine what's going on here now. You got this miskeen, talib, or six of them, on 30 pence a day. Now we're on 600 pounds a month. Huh? living large in, in, in Kenya all I have to do is do you know five daily salawat a khutbah a dars a dars one dars for the day or for the, for the week so you will find during the summer months or during the year, periodically, they would send some of their students to propagate this Sururi Tekfiri Ikhwani Dawa. These people who are employed now for this magnificent wage, it becomes difficult for you now to refuse to translate. Because you're getting 600 pounds a month while everybody else around you is on 20 pence a day. Huh? And you don't want to leave or lose your job because life is good. Life is now good for you. And this is how Ihya Turaf went around all those poorer countries setting up masajid and setting up marakis and turning innocent people into takfiris, into suicide bombers, into uh, people revolting against rulers and calling for revolt. Believe me, it was Ehtaraf and the likes of them that done these things. So now they appeared in London. Abu Anas, our Sheikh at that time, Allah Yahdi, mentioned an important piece of information which we can't thank him more for. He said, when he, because Abu Anas was here, he was doing a doctorate in one of the, in the Birmingham University. So we used to be here for long periods of time. When he went to London, he went to visit the bookshop where he met Abdul Sept. And he started speaking to Abdul Sept, and he knows Abdul Sept, Tikfiri, Khutubi, all of that stuff. What did Abdul Sept tell him? He goes, Ihya Turaf, we're coming to cement ourselves in Great Britain. And. We're coming here to target two individuals specifically. And we're going to send individuals to target the dawah of two individuals specifically. 
Abu Sufyan Makdawul and Abu Talha. These two individuals, we are people we're going to send to target them to in order to bring down their dawah. So now, we'll get back to that a bit later as well. Brixton, I've now got Abu Usama. And they can't afford to pay him. All of a sudden, who turns up in Brixton except for some of the members of the And I know first and what took place because both Abdul Haq and Abu Usama explained to me what happened. So this is not no giddy 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 now. This is what they both told me. <coughs> Brixton wanted to buy a free two one to three tape machine. You know those tape machines where you put one tape in there and it records free so that you can easily distribute tapes amongst the community. And sell tapes. They were about fifteen hundred pound, and they couldn't afford to buy one. Ihya Toraf gave them an offer to aid them with that, but they wanted to have a sitting first about other matters also. So they had this sitting. After them saying yes, we will help you towards your cassette machine. They said we have one more thing. We want to employ Abu Usama and Dhabi to work for us. Abdul Haq and his, his crew of men will say no. You are a charitable organization here to Raf. Rather, you should pay Abu Usama to stay in Brixton so he's able to give dawah. And Abu Usama will be under us. We will be in control of Abu Usama. Yataraf says, no, 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 no. We will pay Abu Usama to stay in Brixton, but when our scholars come over, then he works for us. Brixton said, no. Nah. We don't agree with that. And then they became at loggerheads arguing. Abu Usama told me personally, when that started, I told him, look, like, you just forget about it. Let, let me talk to them. You guys, you know, take a back seat. Shala, I'll see you tomorrow, whatever. Let me negotiate with them. So Abu Usama negotiated with Ihyatraf. He used to refer to them as rich Arabs. They agreed that he would work or stay in Brixton and they would pay him. But when their scholars come over or their tulab or their teachers came over that Abu Usama would translate for them. And they would also give those scholars a, a kursi or a seat in Brixton to teach from Brixton also. So look at the, the problem now. Abu Sam is not working for Brixton. He's working for Ihya Turaf. This arrangement lasted for a couple of months. Then in the summer, they sent Ahmed Salam. Put up your hand if you know Ahmed Salam. Ay, mashallah. A lot of the European brothers know Ahmed Salam. Huh? <coughs> Ahmed Salam, well known Kutubi, well known Sururi, came over in Brixton and done a talk. Abu Usama translated. Now you can ask them, brothers, if they still have the tape. Where Ahmed Salam, in the middle of the talk, said, As for Say Kutub and Maududi, and Hassan al-Banna and Muhammad Surur all of these are afdal better 
an accent than any of the Muslim rulers. It's a mushkila. That's Qutubi Kalam. That's, that's Tatbiri Kalam. You can't speak about the rulers like that and compare these ones who call for the removal of leaders and incite the people to, to, to change rulers and to fight against them say that they are better than any of the Muslim rulers. And Abu Sama sat down there and translated it. After that, various Qutubis came over to England. And Abu Sama was the translator for Ayatollah. He told me personally, he said to me, he goes, these guys, they pay me £25 an hour when we go on, because they used to go on journey, they used to come to Birmingham, go to Bradford, go to Leeds, they even used to do camps like Forest and Dean. They used to go there and bring the people there. He said, them guys, they pay me £25 an hour even when I'm not translating. Now imagine that, Ikhwan, where he is struggling in England, can't get no money, and you're on £25 an hour translating. So when you're on a journey with Abdul Salam, Abnan Abdul Qadir, or any of these Ta'banis, you're receiving £25 an hour without even translating. You may only translate two times for the day. One hour each time. So you times that. 24 hours times 24 pounds. And sometimes they'll be like that for two or three weeks. So this guy came over and started working with Ihya Turaf. And no doubt, like, like Sheikh Mukhbil said, Ma nahtaj Kuwaiti dananir. We don't need the, the Kuwaiti dinar. We don't need it. But some people do need it. And they love it. And he went up and down the country, aiding the likes of Adnan Abdul Qadir, who is refuted. Sheikh Salih Fawzan and the Lejna. They refuted Adnan Abdul Qadir. They call him Qutubi because he is a defender of Sayyid Qutub and his manhaj. When we used to, now we're going on to 97, when we used to say to Abu Usama, Ya Abu Usama, Utruhum, Utukum, leave them off. You don't need to work with Hatta al Anjri. Hafifahullah offered Abu Usama, he said, I will pay you what they pay you just so you leave them. Look at that. Andrew said this, I will pay you, Abu Sama, what they pay you, for you to leave them. What happened? He wouldn't leave them. What happens when you lend your ear to Ahl al-Bidah? The Salaf used to say, it would be better for me to see my child coming out of the house of a prostitute than to be coming out of the house of Ahl al-Bidah. Why? Because astaghfirullah, doing sin is something a person will seek forgiveness for Allah for. But you, being infected by Ahl al-Bidah, will change your deen. And you will not seek forgiveness for that. Because you will think you are upon the straight path. Abu Usama became infected. So much so, one day he went to visit Abu Talha. And Abu Khadija was present. And I at other times was present. When he turned around and said, the likes of Sheikh Muqbil, the only reason why they refute Ihya Turaf is because they used to give him money. And when Sheikh Muqbil, when they decide to stop giving him money, he decided to start refuting them and speaking ill about them. This is the kalam of Abu Usama in defense of Ihya Turaf. So before the Isha, I'll explain 
that this is what took place with Abu Usama in his first tour. His first coming to Great Britain. He was the one that defended Ihya Turaf. <coughs> Al-Andri said a statement to us at that time. Wallahi ikhwan wa akhawat. This statement should be written in gold. He said to us, Ya ikhwan, if you guys do not refute Ihya Turaf here in Great Britain, believe me, it took them five years to destroy our dawa in Kuwait. And it goes with you guys, they will finish you off in less than a year. And you know what the result will be? This statement is just so true. Those who have minds to reflect, reflect upon what Andrew said. He said, and they will have you believe in your Salafi when you're really Ikhwan. You go and speak to them up there, ya Ikhwan. And they will tell you, where's Salafi? What are you talking about? Why, where's Salafi? Nothing wrong with sitting with Ikhwan and Muslimin. Nothing wrong with like, sitting with Mami Surur and his, and his gang. Nothing wrong with listening to them. Where is Salafi? Where is Salafi? No, you're not. That's not Salafi. <laughs> so what if we do talks or we unite with the Brelvis? So what if we call the people to vote and democ- of democracy? So what? Is that Salafi, Ikhwan? But you can't tell them you're not Salafi. That's Ikhwanian. That's not Salafi. They won't understand. So alhamdulillah, we went on a war path with Ihya Turaf. And wallahi, we done maybe four, I'm not sure, four blazing meteors. This was things that we put out, leaflets, refuting Ihya Turaf. Using the Mashaykh, at that time Sheikh Rabi'ah, Sheikh Mukbil, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Adi, and Madkhali, Abdusan Burj, all these Mashaykh. And we refuted them. And we finished them. And the only thing that kept them alive was Abu Usama. So we all came to a head. Where? Where did it come to a head? Abu Usama claimed, you know, all right, we're going to make Hajj. 1997, which is the most memorable Hajj we made. When we make Hajj, we're going to sit with the scholars in Medina. And we're going to ask them what they say about Ihya Turaf. So we all went. From them, from those who went with us. The likes of Ismail, Abu Is- uh, Ismail, Abu Tayyib. From them, Abdul Razak, as sanani Somali. From them, Abu Hakim was present. Myself, I was present. Abu Khadija was present. And others were present, I can't remember the names now. Every single scholar we sat with in Medina said, leave Ihya Turaf, leave them. Abu Sam was present beside us, leave them. They are Ahlul Bid'ah, they will change your deen. Run, flee from them, flee from their fitna, the fitna of the dananir of their, 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 their dinar, their wealth. Flee them, they will change your deen. All of the scholars said that in Medina except for Abdul Muhsin. Abdul Muhsin al-Abad, Hafifahullah ta'ala, he said, My son goes with them, so I don't really know much about them. But my son goes with them, so I think there would be a good organization if my son went with them. That's it. That wasn't given to Adil, praising them. The Shaykh didn't really know them. But all of the other Sheikh, Sheikh Salih Suhaimi, Sheikh Rabi ibn, at that time Sheikh Rabi was in Medina. Sheikh Muhammad Hadi. Mashaykh that are not even alive now. All refuted them. So when we returned back to England, we said to Abu Usama, and inshallah we'll end with this point until after Isha, we said to Abu Usama, what are you going to do? 
What are you going to do? Because you're the only one who's saving Ihtiraf now. What did he say to us? He said, Inshallah, I'm leaving this fitna and I'm going back to America. Shuf, shuf, shufal at tashwish. Hey, look, you never said they were wrong. You said, I'm leaving them and I'm going back to America, my homeland. What did he do? Except that he went to work for Ihya Turaf in America, in Florida. Well, inshallah, we'll continue the rest after Isha was. As soon as we got this, their propaganda started. First thing, and those who are shuhada to this, they said this masjid will be called Robalip Masjid. <laughs> Robalip Masjid, huh? Because it's all going to be just black people here. Huh? And Shidi Mosque. That was the aqwal from those up there. But Alhamdulillah, we opened the Masjid. And we called to clear cut Dawah Salafiyah here for how many years? They had nothing going on up in their Masjid. So what happened? What's all the confusion about now? Except that when our dawah became huge, because the circles still were like this in here, what happened? There became a bunch of people who were Ahlul Hadith. And they came amongst the Pakistani folk who were amongst us, the Shabab. And they started to say, how can you leave Ali al-Hadith? Look at us up there. We defend Pakistan. We're Salafi up there. We're calling the people to the same thing they're calling to. They split from us. We should, you should go back up there and be with them. So then you add a migration of several Pakistani, Indian brothers that were convinced by their wiswas. And then they left there and went up there. But still, there was still a large amount of revert brothers here, and some Pakistani brothers that stayed, and other brothers. So there was still a large number here. So they needed someone to remove those black brothers from this pasture. So who did they get? Who can tell me? Ah, mashallah. Not again? Abu Sama. Now remember, in his origin, when he first, on his first tour, when he came to Great Britain, what was his argument? I don't want nothing to do with them Pakistani guys, them Ahl Hadith guys, their Taban, their this, their... Wallahi, he did not do even a kalima in their masjid. Any time he done any dars or any type of ma'adhara here, he done it in the amana. He wouldn't do anything in their masjids. Now all of a sudden, and by the way, while this was all going on, Ihya Turaf was still aiding Greenland. They were still aiding Greenland. So, bringing in Abu Usama was the perfect plan. Getting here, making give some of those fantastic, wild khutbas, you know, you know, you used to have some of those brothers, and a bit of jaila in them, you know, we come out there, give one of those raw khutbas. But a lot of people up until now have not realized the manhaj of Abu Usama. These manhajis, wallahi, divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. What does Abu Usama do? And I can tell you how many different masajid, how many different communities he's done this. He goes into a place. For instance, when he first came here, 
You have some brothers who are calling to clear cut Salafia. Clear cut Salafia. And they are the du'at of that area. Then you'll have some brothers who are Salafi and they're down with the brothers, but they still got a bit of that jailia in them. They still got a bit of, you know, you know what I mean? Bit of roughness still with them. Huh? They're not like the ones that call and want to be upright and dress a certain way and act a certain way. So he will come in and he will see them there. And you will see these ones here who still have that bit of jail in them. And then you will draw close to these ones. Huh? And then they feel special because he's a sheikh, man. Look at him. Look at his ilm. Look at his vibe, how he does it. I remember when he first came here doing those wild talks like, wow, you can say stuff like that. But only to certain brothers. You wouldn't say that to Abu Talha, you wouldn't say that to them. But to certain brothers, you would do that, you know. You know, we need to go out there, we need to do our thing, you know. Messenger of Allah. I remember somebody uh, gave, when he gave the translation of the hadith, you know the hadith, any of you, where the Messenger of Allah had won or had defeated the people. And, they, and he had got the boot, he got the war. Uh, what's booty again? Huh? Spoils. Spoils of war, that's it. <laughs> so one of the Bedo Arabs, they came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu and slapped him on his back and said, Ya Rasulullah, give me some of Allah's wealth. I, like in a raw way, because he's a Bedo Arab. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu turned to him and smiled and said, give him some of the, the, the spoils of war, inshallah. Because the messenger of Allah was like that. Because he, he grew up with the Bedos and he knew their Uslu. As for Abu Sama, when he translates it, he said, yeah, and this guy, he came to the messenger of Allah. You know, one of those kind of ghetto guys. Eh? And he slapped the messenger of Allah, Salaam, and he's back and said, yo, give me some money. <laughs> give me some money. <laughs> now, if you don't really know the hadith, <laughs> and you hear that you think oh, man, serious man the, the messenger of Allah was yeah he was nobody fools the people with this and he and he governs those people who are impressed with that impressed with it so he can spread his thing I remember we done a trip to Brixton years ago and wallahi, the likes of Abu 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 Fadayl is a witness to this. We were on Salafia, clear cut. This guy came about, we did a trip to Brixton for some meeting and some dao or some dart. And on the way back on the coach, coach was full of people, all black people, because <laughs> that was his thing. And he turned around to us and he goes, you know what we want to start doing? We want to start inviting the likes of Siraj Wahaj. Can you know Siraj Wahaj? Anyone know Siraj Wahaj? You know, he will like, you know, inspire the people. No, he won't really say nothing wrong like that. He might just quote a hadith wrong or something, but you know, he, you know, inspire people, move and so on and so forth. And we just do a conference, get Shiraj Raj, and let's do it with the, do it with the Hizbul Tahrir. So we can get their people there, and they can see Salif Dawa, and they can see, yeah, you know, this is how it is. And then Babu Fudel went to him, but isn't that against the Sunnah? He's like, but you know, yeah, we're just trying to do dawah. He goes, but it's in dawah. Toki fear. And not ishtihadiya. Isn't dawah something that is revealed? And we follow what has been revealed? And not something that we just make up from ourselves? He was like, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Like, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, you're saying you know. I'm just saying, you know, it's an idea. It's like, this is Abu Sama. I'm telling you, Kwan. This is him. So anyway... They brought back Abu Sama. Back here on his second tour. Second tour of duty. Now he's with Greenland. Ah, money, getting paid, and sitting down, calling the people away from here. 
how many of the brothers that we know personally brothers and that's why I mentioned the beginning of the talk this talk is for those four groups of people those who know what took place over the last 20 years and have stayed firm and then those who know what took place and they're acting like they don't know because they may have a desire you know what I mean sitting in Abu Talal's lessons is a bit boring it's not you know, it's not all of that. Abu Khadija listens, not all of that. You know, it's listening and taking notes. It's not a vibe. Huh? And we find it hard to get into that. You know me, but Abu Salman, mashallah, it moves me. When I hear him, he moves me. It makes me feel good. And any of you, Ikhwan, Consult your heart now. Consult your heart. Those who have listened to him, at one stage when you first heard him, didn't you feel that like, yeah, this guy's a bit, you know, because he has that effect. So now, the whole legion has teamed up again. Ihya Turaf, Abu Usama, and those who are with them. So now we find those people coming here confused. Confused as to are they, you know what I mean, on, on the clear cut Salafia? Are they, do they really, you know what I mean, are they like you? Are, but know that if you know the history, and wallahi, we only, honestly, this is not even a third of the history which we could sit down and speak about now. There's many issues I have not mentioned. I haven't mentioned the Hakika of Brixton. I haven't mentioned Luton. I haven't mentioned no more about Abu Alia. I haven't mentioned about Sweb Hassan. I've mentioned none of them. I've just mentioned about what has taken place here in Birmingham now. Those people who have this problem in their heart and they feel like some of the ishtihadis that have come about that you know that we go there and we go here the manager of Ahl Sunnah the Salaf never used to lend their ears to Shubahat they never used to lend their ears to Shubahat things that were called doubt in their hearts Wallahi you know Ikhwan wa Akhawat from 1995 up until now, we have been with the likes of Muhammad and Madkhali, Abdusalam Burjis, Al Anjali, Sheikh Mukhbil, Rahimullah Taala, Aye, Sheikh Rabia. How much of the mashaykh can we mention that we have been here? Those who clarify the dikta. Manhaj Salafi. Don't leave here and believe that what you're going to get up there is clear cut Manhaj Salafi. Because you won't get that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Allah mentioned, فَلَمَّا زَاغُوا أَزَاغَ اللَّهُ كُلُوبًا وَمَنْ يَحْدِي لَهُ فَلَا مُضِلَّ لَهُ Allah mentions and when they became perverse Allah increased them in their perversity how does a person become perverse? because he lends his ear he is mustaqim upon this he knows this the reason why he's here is because of what's been told about here but then he decides to lend his ear to the opposition and that's not our salaf they did not use to lend their ears to Ahl al-Bida or Ahl al-Ahwa or those who have with them Shubahat and how much brothers have we seen turn up here upon Yaqeen that this is the Haq but then they're encouraged to do the Colombo thing like I mentioned before go and investigate what really happened as if what you've been told here is a lie so we just gave you this brief history 
as to what has taken place over the last 20 years or 22 years for those who were here prior to Maghrib and those who have turned up now will just have got the tail end of what's taking place and that which is khair from what I said is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and any incorrection, any, anything incorrect or anything wrong then it's from myself wa subhanakallah wa bihamdika ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta astaghfiru wa atubu